Hello, I'm Pastor Russ, the pastor of St. Mark's United Methodist Church. It's good to have you back in school. Welcome. Over the last couple of years, my wife Stephanie and I have come to the middle school each week to teach the eighth grade class. Obviously, this week is different. COVID has changed everything in our lives. And that's okay, because the one thing that is constant, the one thing that never changes, is our God. And the one thing that I want you to understand is His love for you never, ever changes. So in order to assist your teachers, I'm going to be making some short videos over the next few weeks to teach you a little more about God. One of the goals of the church and the school together is to teach you the important things in life, things that will assist you for the rest of your life. So please don't tune out. These are going to be short videos, and hopefully they'll be instructional and helpful for you both in your school life as well as for the rest of your life as you live with the confidence of knowing who God is. We're going to begin today with who God is, his very nature. God reveals that he is Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So watch the short video that I'm going to play now, and I'll be back in just a few minutes. The Absolute Basics of the Christian Faith Who is God? The Trinity is one of the most important theological ideas ever, but it gives people panic attacks when they think about it. So this chapter will give you the building blocks you need to understand what the Trinity is and why it matters so much. God is three persons who have existed for all eternity, are all equally powerful, wise, and good, and have always depended on each other. There's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit existing in perfect harmony as one God. So how can this be? How can you have three things that exist perfectly together as one? Well, here's the thing. If you can understand a tiny bit about how music works, you can understand the basics of the Trinity. So find a piano, pick any white key, and put your thumb on it, then skip a white key and put your index finger on the next one, then skip one more and put your middle finger on the next white key. Now press down your thumb, index finger, and middle finger, and boom, there's a harmonic chord. Three distinct sounds all existing in a perfect harmony. Three things that are also one thing. The threeness and the oneness work perfectly together. This gives us a picture, rather a sound, of what God is like. There is one God, like the one chord, with three persons, like the three notes, all existing in perfect harmony forever. So unlike the chord, which we just played, which came into being, then ceased to exist, the three persons of the Trinity have always existed. They've always existed in the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father has always been Father to the Son. You can't be a Father without a Son. The Son has always been Son to the Father and they've always been unified by the love of the Spirit. What this means is the most basic fact of all reality is loving relationship. Before there was a world, there was a family, the family of the triune God. So when you get down to the very bottom of things, to the root of all reality, there's love. C.S. Lewis makes this interesting point in Mere Christianity. He writes, All sorts of people are fond of repeating the Christian statement that God is love, but they seem not to notice that the words God is love have no real meaning unless God contains at least two persons. Love is something that one person has for another person. If God was a single person, then before the world was made, he was not love. So the fact that God is perfectly loving requires that God is relational. And the opposite is also true. The fact that God is relational requires that God is perfectly loving. And here's why. If God is triune, we know that God is love because you can't have three people existing for all eternity in harmonious relationship if they aren't perfectly loving. Imagine existing for all eternity with your brothers and sisters or even your friends. Eventually you get into some fights, but the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they don't fight. We know that God is love because God is a trinity, and we know that God is a trinity because God is love. So the Trinity is this perfect loving relationship that's always existed, one God and three persons. And because the Trinity is one God, the persons work together in everything they do. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says, we are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The entire Trinity is at work in saving us. So we must name the whole Trinity as we're made part of Christ's body through baptism. And it's not just baptism. All throughout the story of Jesus, we see all three persons at work. There's a pattern here. The Father is the source of everything and he sends the Son to the world in the power of the Spirit. We see this in Jesus' birth. By the Holy Spirit, the Son of God is born into the world. We see this in Jesus' baptism. The Son carries out the mission of the Father in the power of the Spirit. And we see this in Jesus' blessing, his disciples, when he ascends. When the Son goes back to the Father, he 
sends the Spirit to empower us. Did you detect the pattern? Here it is again. The Father is the source and goal of our salvation. Jesus is the way, and the Holy Spirit is the power to get there. Imagine it a bit like this. The Father is the one who says, let there be light, and the Son goes and flips on the light switch, and the Spirit is the electricity that powers the light bulb. The Father is the source, the Son is the way, and the Holy Spirit is the power. Another way of thinking about this is to imagine yourself kneeling and praying the Lord's Prayer. We're praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Now imagine Jesus is standing beside you. And so we begin by praying our Father, and immediately we see that Jesus is helping us to have right relationship with his Father. Now, also imagine it's the Holy Spirit inside you who is giving you the power to pray the prayer Jesus taught us. The Son beside you, the Father above you, the Spirit inside you, all working to give us right relationship with God. All this might seem a bit mysterious and complicated, but the nice thing is that once you start looking for the Trinity, you see it everywhere. For instance, the very words of the Apostles' Creed are shaped by the Trinity. We begin with the Father, the Source, and move to the Son, the Way, and end with the Spirit, the Spirit's area of work empowering the Church. The Father above you, Jesus beside you, the Spirit inside you. There you go. There's the Trinity. Welcome back, and thank you for joining me in my kitchen this morning. As the video revealed to you, God's nature is Trinity, three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's hard to understand that, and I readily recognize that. The Trinity is a concept that is hard to grasp, and yet it is how God has revealed himself to us. But the truth is that God has revealed this idea of three in one in nature. We just see it all the time so often that we don't pay any attention to it. For example, I have a piece of ice and I have a glass of water. What are these? H2O, right? And we know that H2O can be a liquid. It can be a solid. I like ice water. And if it is hot enough, it can turn into steam. Three different modes, although we don't talk about God with reference to modes, but, but H2O can be seen in three different ways, and yet it's all H2O. Now, I got a funny one for you. We make three-in-ones sometimes. My son works at Dunkin' Donuts, and I love Boston cream. It's a three-in-one. You've got the chocolate, You've got the, the, the cake, and if they filled it right, you have the creamy center. We make three-in-ones. We see it all the time. It's all donut, but yet there are three different aspects to the one donut. But God has revealed it to us in nature in other ways. For example, take an apple. I like apples. An apple has the peel. Is the peel apple? Absolutely. But when you open it up, you have the, the pulp or the meat, the part we like to eat. But then you have the core. Is the core apple? Absolutely. Is the meat apple? Yes. Is the peel apple? Sure is. Three in one, all apple, and yet distinct from one another, but all part of the whole. Another thing we see in nature, that God reveals the three in one is an egg. Now I like eggs different ways, but let me ask you, you wanna eat the shell? No, but is the shell egg? Absolutely. What about the white? The white is egg, but it's not the yolk and it's not the shell. The yolk is egg, but it is not the white and not the shell. The yolk is egg, the white is egg, the shell is egg, and yet there's only one egg, but we see three different parts of the one egg. That's kind of how it is. Every illustration falls short a little bit, but the truth is that God has revealed himself as one God in three persons, three persons in one God. It's a difficult concept, but it's how God has chosen to reveal himself to us. God is Father. God is Son, and God is the Holy Spirit. This next video is a little longer, but it goes into more detail to help us understand the nature of God. 
And the first place we need to start is understanding what God has revealed about himself. And then we can more fully understand everything that our God has done for us. Watch the video and I'll be right back. So I've got a question that's always bothered me. The Bible says there's one God, but in other parts of the Bible, God is three, Father, Son, and Spirit. How can it be both? Yeah, this is a question that has mystified people for thousands of years. And while we can't fully explain it, I think we can better understand what it is that we can't fully understand. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, think of it this way. Here's a two-dimensional plane. And then here's an object with three dimensions that's going to pass through the 2D plane. Okay, right. From this perspective, the 3D objects above and below the plane. So now it makes sense. But imagine you were a 2D person stuck on the 2D plane. What would you see? I don't know. What would I see? Well, it would look like this. Oh, yeah, okay. From this perspective, it looks impossible. It's one object, and then, then two objects, and then three. But in reality, they're all one, just not in a way you're capable of understanding. Now, let's take this whole thing as a visual analogy for how we experience God. The claim in the Bible is that God is transcendent, a divine being through whom we live and move and have our being. Or, as God says, I am. Okay, but I live here in this universe, so when God appears, it will make sense in some ways, but in other ways, it will break my categories. Exactly. This happens all the time when people encounter the God of the Bible. So let's look first at how this happens in the Hebrew Scriptures. Throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, God appears in complicated ways that don't quite fit our categories. One common way this happens is with God's attributes. So an attribute is a way to describe what something is like. For example, a soccer ball is round. Right. Or God is wise. Yeah, great. Let's take God's wisdom. So the book of Proverbs says that God created the world by his wisdom. But then there are also poems in the book of Proverbs that describe God's wisdom as a person, a co-worker through whom God architected the universe. So God's attribute becomes a separate character? Yeah. This also happens with God's glory, which sometimes appears as a human figure on a throne that's engulfed in fire. Or take God's word, which he can speak to people, but sometimes his word appears like a person. Wait, so God's attributes have become new little gods? No, no. The biblical authors believe there's only one all-powerful God. But they're comfortable talking about them as different characters. Yeah, this is part of the way that the biblical authors portray the one God's complex identity. They're God's attributes and also distinct from God. Distinct from God and also God. Yes. Once we learn to spot that way of talking about God's identity, you begin to see it all over the scriptures. In fact, you find it in the first sentences of the Bible that mention the Spirit of God. So the opening line of the Bible is pretty familiar. In the beginning, God created. But then keep reading. Who is it that we see within creation hovering over the waters? The Spirit of God. Yeah, so the Spirit refers to God's personal presence and energy that we can interact with here within creation. And so the Bible can refer to God's Spirit as distinct from God. Distinct from God and also God. It's God's Spirit. And while this sounds strange from our point of view, this complexity is what the biblical authors are trying to get us to see. So we've looked at God's attributes and God's Spirit. Now let's make our last stop exploring God's complex identity in the Hebrew Scriptures with a character called the Son of Man. So in the Bible, there's only one God that people are to worship, which makes this story in the book of Daniel really surprising. Daniel has a dream about a human figure called the Son of Man, which means a member of humanity. And Daniel dreams about this human getting elevated on a cloud up and then higher up. Up into God's space. Yes. And then this human sits at the right hand of God's heavenly throne and all humanity worships this human alongside God. A human where I expect to see God. Yeah. This human is a part of God's identity. This vision is about the climactic hope of the whole biblical story. God and humanity become one so they can rule the world together as one. So the Son of Man is distinct from God and also God. Exactly. So think back over everything we've looked at. In the Hebrew Scriptures, God's identity is complex. And so when Jesus' followers encountered God as the Father, Son, and the Spirit, they already had categories for how these could all be the one God of the Bible. Okay, let's talk about that. 
Okay, so in the New Testament, we're introduced to Jesus of Nazareth. And he's human, but way more. His favorite title to call himself was the Son of Man. The figure in Daniel's vision. And the claim is that he is this complex God become human to unite other humans with God. Okay, so the Gospels portray Jesus as fully human. And also as Yahweh, the God of Israel. Jesus went around saying and doing things that only Yahweh can do, like forgiving people's sins or calming the chaotic waters. So they're saying Jesus is a human distinct from God and also God. Yeah, and that might sound crazy unless you've been reading the Hebrew scriptures, which prepared you for it. And then check this out. Jesus' first followers, the apostles, talked about his identity using the language of God's attributes. They called Jesus the glory of God, or the apostle Paul called Jesus the wisdom of God. Or John opens his gospel calling Jesus the word of God through whom the world was created. And then he says, the word was with God and was God. Okay, I get what they're doing and it hurts my brain. Totally. And if you want to spin your brain even more, consider this. Jesus, who's portrayed as God become human, would talk to God as a distinct person. And when he did, he called him Father. When Jesus talked about God, he wasn't referring to an abstract force or energy. He was talking about a personal being that you can relate to. There's a lot of personal images of God in the Bible. Ruler, creator, judge. But Jesus consistently referred to God as my father. Jesus experienced God as a source of infinite love. He said, the father has loved me since before the creation of the world. Apparently, Jesus knew the Father as an eternally others-centered, life-giving being. Right, like in the story about Jesus' baptism, when the Father says from heaven, this is my son whom I love. And then keep reading in that story, the person who brings that message of love from the Father to the Son is the Spirit of God. So we've talked about God's Spirit. Here within creation, it's through the Spirit that we interact with the divine. Yeah, and the same was true for Jesus. Through the Spirit, he experienced the Father's love. But it didn't stop there. Jesus promised that through him, the Spirit would go out and share the Father's love with all humanity and with all creation. So it can look like these are three distinct gods, but in some way that transcends my view of reality, they're also one. Right. This is what later followers of Jesus called the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are the one God of the Bible. I could see how they got there. But this isn't just a philosophy puzzle. To describe God as a triunity is to claim that the universe is held together by an eternal community of love. Which is something that I can't really understand. But the God of the Bible isn't a being that you understand. The point is to know and be known by this God so that we can participate in his love. One of the things we need to understand is that we can never fully understand God. If we could understand God, then he's way too small. In the ancient world, people made up gods who were just like people around them, kind of superhumans. You've heard their names, Zeus, Hades, Ares, Aphrodite, Hera, and the rest of the pantheon of ancient gods. The people took the idea of a superhuman and made them into their god. And the thing about the gods of the old world is they were just as fickle as people. They were egotistical. They were mean. They were jealous, immoral, and all the failings we see in people. The reason they did this is because they wanted a God they could understand, a God who was just like them, but just stronger. When the one true God chose to reveal himself, it was, there was very little that people could understand. They could only understand God insofar as he revealed himself. We can't understand everything about God. He's simply too big for us to fully comprehend. But you know, that's okay. Who wants a small God? We have a big God. And the wonderful thing about a big God, especially our God, is that he wants us to know him. Not just know about him, but know him in a personal way. Because of this, he chose to become like us in the person of his son, Jesus. I can't relate to a God who's bigger than me. 
but I can relate to a God who came into the world to be like me. I can relate to Jesus, a God who comes to be like me and to be with me. Over the next several weeks, we'll learn more about Jesus and about God's unfailing love for us in him. So until then, have a wonderful and blessed weekend.